All right, today's uh, sermon is called The Perfect Word of God. And um, the purpose I'm preaching this today is um, I want you, when you read the Bible in your own time, I want you to trust what you're reading. You know, I want you to be able to read it and know that what you're reading is the perfect Word of God. Now, in, in our church, we believe that the perfect Word of God in English is the King James Bible. But in, in this uh, sort of area of discussion, you know, you'll hear a lot of people sort of emphasize like the original languages, the original writings, the original languages. Now the problem is we don't have those original writings anymore. Those are long gone and they've been copied and copied and copied and we have copies of those originals today. And in the original languages, I mean, the Old Testament was, you know, Hebrew um, and the, the New Testament is Greek. I mean, not everyone speaks these languages. And sometimes when you go to churches, there's a big emphasis on the original languages. You know, and they preach sermons. They keep going back to the Greek, back to the Hebrew. And really, what this does to just your average Christian is makes them doubt. Like, well, do I have God's Word? When I read it, uh, do I, can I understand it? And, and it's, to me, and, and what I don't like about this sort of, uh, this sort of um, position on the Bible is it, it takes away the Bible from the common person. It's almost like what the Catholic Church does when it's like, oh, you only know the real Bible if it's in Latin. The Muslims do it too. Oh, you only know the real Quran if you know Arabic. But God is not like that. And I want to show you from the Bible that there's no reason why we can't have a perfect translation in English and that English translation be equally authoritative as the original languages so that when you read your Bible you know that you are reading the 100% perfect Word of God you can have faith in it you can trust it as you trust it with your salvation um, so I feel like this sort of movement of you know, going back to the Greek and going back to languages that t people don't speak in the church is really just taking away the bible from you and putting it into you know like some sort of papacy where you know only the church can explain to you what the bible really means or only person people who know the real languages can tell you what it really means so i want to talk about some arguments today to show look there's no reason why that the word of god cannot be in english and it can't be perfect at the same time now, amongst those that believe, you know, there are, there are people in different camps where, you know, do they use the King James Bible or do they use another translation? I put it in those two camps because that's really the two camps there are because a lot of these other Bible translations are using a different manuscript base. The King James uses a different manuscript base and that's really where the argument is and why there's all these different translations. Now, our church is a King James only church. We, we use the King James not just because of tradition, we use it because we believe it's the accurate one. Um, and, and I won't go into all that topic today. But amongst churches that use the King James Bible, uh, there is a spectrum, right? That not, all King, not all churches that use the King James Bible have the same position on the King James Bible. For example, you have churches that just believe that the King James Bible is just one of many translations. And, uh, you know, why does that, their church use it or why does their preacher use it? Well, that's just the Bible that they were using. That's just the one they're comfortable with. That's the one that they're used to. Um, that's not my, my view, right? So I don't use the King James Bible just because that's the one I used, you know, as, as a Christian in the last churches or the churches I was taught in. Another position on this spectrum is people say, well, the King James Bible is not perfect, you know, so it is inferior to the original languages, and that's the position where you hear preaching, and they're always going back to the Greek, always going back to the Greek, right? Every time they preach a sermon, they're always going back, oh, but it, this is what the, the Bible says, but in the originals, it really means this, it really says this, and they're just always taking you back there. They would have this view, where, you know, the, the King James Bible is like the most faithful translation. So they believe it's the best one in English and that's the why they use it, but they don't believe it's perfect and they believe they can get more insight and more truth just by going back to the original languages. And, and really, don't be fooled because generally what is happening when they go back to the original languages is that they're just going to like a lexicon or they're going to a dictionary and they're just looking up different meanings and then seeing how those different meanings can apply to whatever sermon they're teaching. But those of us that speak different languages, you know, you can't just pick whatever meaning you want from a dictionary. If a word has four meanings, you can't just use whichever one you want. I mean, it depends on the context. It depends on how it's used. There's, there's a lot of different things that go into it. And if you think about it, the King James Bible is, is in and of itself a dictionary because it's, it has, from those King James translators, that it, they have chosen, based on their expertise and the context, which meaning is the right meaning. 
right? So it's not just any meaning of a word that you look in a dictionary. Like you look in a dictionary and there's four meanings. In a sentence, you just can't choose whichever one you want based on whatever sermon you're preaching. I mean, there's, there's, there has to be a right meaning. And I believe that the King James Bible has that right meaning. So can I prove that the King James Bible is the perfect word of God? No, I can't. So there are some things in the Christian life that are by faith. But what I can explain to you from the word of God is that there's no reason why an English translation can't be perfect, right? And that's sort of my view on the King James Bible. So there is, it's one of many translations. There's, it's the most faithful, but it's not perfect. Then you have the view that it's actually accurate and it's equal to the originals. So you don't, there's not a need to learn Greek and Hebrew because if you have a perfect translation in English, that is sufficient, right? It's, it's equivalent, right? So if, even if you learn Greek or Hebrew and you say, oh, I can understand Greek and Hebrew, I'll read the, the uh, original language Bibles, it should be saying the same thing. That's what I mean by it. it's an accurate, accurate and equal to the originals. <coughs> now, am I saying it has to be in the exact words that are in the King James Bible? No, because languages are not like maths. It's not like one plus one equals two. There are, there are different ways you can say things in a different language and they mean the same thing. There are you know, synonyms, for example, where you have different words that mean the same thing. So I'm not of the view that it has to be that exact phrasing, but I am of the view that there's a reason why the King James Bible is using the English that it does. And it's because that type of English with the these and the thous has a level of accuracy that our modern day colloquial English does not. Like our English you does not differentiate between singular and plural the, thou versus ye, you. Right? So I think there are good reasons for why the King James Bible is written the way it is. So it's not just there to be poetic and sound good. It's also written that way to be brief and concise. It's also written that way to line up with the, you know, the, the way the Greek words are ordered as well. So there's a bit of that in it too. But also there's the accuracy of the these and the thous, which is missing in just everyday English that we speak. And that's why your modern day Bibles, they lose that when they just translate it just to a modern day English. But I'm not of the view that you know, some of the words could be changed, but they mean the same thing. Because like I said, we have synonyms, we have different ways of saying things, but it means the same thing. Because language is not an exact science. But my point is, there's no need to go to another language. It's equally authoritative. And the main question really is to be addressed is, well, can a translation be perfect? If, it can, if a translation can be perfect, then there's no reason why we can't have a tra perfect translation in English. Now, I believe we have one in English. I don't believe we necessarily have one in every language. There are some languages where it's still undergoing that process of refinement, where you know, they, they may have languages in their uh, Bibles in their languages, but they may not consider them perfect, and they might, may need some more revisions. But that debate is had amongst God's people, and I believe the debate uh, you know, in the English language, I believe, is settled. Um, but you know, obviously, people still um, disagree and still debate it. Now, the fourth view on the King James only spectrum <coughs> is drum roll is that it's accurate and superior to the originals. So I don't believe that. Some people believe, um, and this will be the view of like say the Sam Gibbs of the world, where they believe the English translation is actually superior because we don't have the originals anymore. It says you, and, and they are of the view that you know, the way it is worded in the King James Bible must be exactly worded that way and if you change any word at all, you're corrupting God's word. And they will even go to the point to say foreign people must learn English to have the real Bible. So it's almost like the, 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 it's turned around. It's now no, you don't learn Greek and Hebrew to get the real Bible. Now you have to learn English. Right? Because the King James Bible is superior and it's what the standard is today for the Bible. Now, I, I don't believe that view. Right? So there is a spectrum of views amongst the King James only crowd. And my view is, like I said, it is equal, and of, equal in authority. Right? That a translation can be perfect. So let's um, talk about it. Today's sermon, it's, it's, uh, it's obviously more of a doctrinal one. So hopefully it's interesting for you. Um, you know, um, it may not be one of those ones that necessarily makes you feel good, but it's one that if you 
understand what I'm teaching here today, it's going to strengthen your faith. It's going to teach you more about the Bible. And there may be some things that you've assumed about God's word that may be corrected in today's sermon. So uh, let's go through uh, my points here today. I'll come back to Jeremiah 36. The reason why we read through Jeremiah 36, and we'll, we'll touch on it at the end, is that um, you may not have noticed as we were going through Jeremiah 36, but there's actually, uh, I feel like it's an example in the Bible that God has, even though it's about Jeremiah delivering some scriptures to this king that obviously did not appreciate what, 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 what was said in the, those scriptures. It, it gives an example of how God's word is delivered, right, and how it's preserved. So uh, we'll come back to Jeremiah 36 at the very end. Now the first point I have is, number one is you have to realize that the word of God is eternal. The word of God is eternal. It didn't come into existence when it was spoken right it didn't come into existence when it was written down right the word of god existed from the very beginning because the word of god is god itself now we don't know like when we talk about the trinity and we talk about the mechanics of the godhead we don't really know exactly how these things work like we can't just look under the hood of god and go ah that's how it all ties together but we have to take by faith what, how God does tell us it works. And how he tells us it works is we have the word of God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So the word of God existed eternally in the beginning with God, but the word is God. The word is spirit. The word has an identity as a he, right? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as the only of begotten, you know, full of grace and truth. So how these tie together, I'm not too sure. But what I do know from God's word is that somehow, not necessarily the ink on the pages, you know, the, 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 the pattern of the, the letters, but those words are spirit, you know, and those words that are spirit can be communicated in different languages. And that word is what gives life, and that word is God himself. So you say, do you have God and then God's words? Yeah, well, you do. You have, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, but you have to remember as well that the word of God is God as well, right? And that word was in the beginning. So the word is eternal. The word didn't come into existence. The word didn't just, you know, come into existence when it was spoken, when it was delivered, when it was written down. No, it's always existed. But that eternal word that existed has been delivered to us through communication of the languages that were spoken on earth, earthly languages, over time. And that's what revelation is. Revelation is not the creation of God's word. Revelation is the, um, the revealing of God's word, the manifestation of God's word. Psalm 119, 160, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Titus 1, 2, look at this, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So you see that, that the promise of salvation, the plan of salvation, how things were, the word of God already existed even before the world began. And that's why Titus 1, 2 can say that God had promises to us of eternal life even before the world began. So think about this. If people say that truth is only found in the original languages, well, what language was God's word in prior to the creation of earthly languages? All right, so this is my point here. This, this is what I'm trying to show you, that the, this idea that there's only one language, that God's truth is locked in, and you, know, you must speak that language, and, and are the originals even still here? You know, these, these ideas that make you doubt that when you read the Word of God in English, that you are reading the pure, unadulterated Word of God. Um, you, know, you, you may not think these affect that, but they do. You know, they do subtly make people doubt the Word of God, and that's what I, what I don't like. Uh, about these teachings. So what language was God's word in prior to the creation of earthly languages? And like I said before, you know, this is kind of like what Islam and Catholicism do. Like what it does is it keeps you from the truth and it makes you reliant on man to have God's word. And that's not the truth. You don't need a man to teach you the word of God, right? Now, does, te does a man teaching you the word of God help? It helps, right? But is it needed? No. If you have the Holy Spirit, you read the Word of God, you can learn everything that I'm teaching you today. Right? There's nothing that cannot be learned 
um, from the Word of God because you know I'm, I'm, that's how I learned it, right? That's how it was taught to me. So number one is you have the you have to remember the Word is eternal. So it's not like it, it was only delivered in one language; it existed before languages even existed. Now, prior to it being written down, <coughs> prior to the Bible being written down, one thing to note that it was spoken that it was spoken why am i saying this because there's a lot of emphasis from people on the originals on the originals on the originals now would it be nice if we had the originals today yeah it would be nice maybe reason why the originals god doesn't want the originals around is because what tends to happen with man is they start to worship these things as artifacts and so maybe it's better that they're not around because god's emphasis is not on these sacred pieces of paper and ink you know, what was important was the words that were spoken, the words that were on that paper and ink. It's not the actual physical thing itself. So now, this is why you have to keep in mind what's important. Uh, one thing to note is God's word is spoken prior to it being written down. See, a lot of the word of God, I think, written in the first five books of the Bible. I mean, Moses came along. You know, many, you know, hundreds of years after. You know, Abraham and Isaac, all the stories that are in there. But these stories were passed down orally, right through the prophets and through the teachers, until finally Moses penned down the first five books of the Bible. And um, you know, a lot of it is like that. See, we read in Titus 1-2, if you remember here, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So we see there the eternality of God's word. Then we read in verse 3, which is getting on to my second point, it says, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Saviour. So you see there, that's how it works, that God's word existed eternally, but over time, revelation, it is manifested through preaching. It is made known, this eternal word that existed. Now, like with God, there are some mysteries that we don't exactly know how it works because there's a mystery in terms of, you know, sometimes you read Paul's letters and they are like opinions of Paul and then they come in to the Word of God. And this is where, obviously, God is outside of time. He knows that these things come to pass. And even though Paul is under the impression that he's giving his opinion, it is actually part of God's eternal Word. And it's just one of those mysteries where we don't know exactly how God works. But, you know, obviously, God is beyond this world. He's able to plan out these words and know that these words are part of his eternal word and yet it manifests through the people that pen down his word and preach his word. So Titus 1.3, How then do you times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me, according to the commandment of God our Saviour. Look at what it says here in 2 Samuel 23, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. So you see here, it's not just men speaking who are, you know, you know, driven by God. You know, we, and we, you know, we'll go to a verse soon where it says it's given by inspiration of God. It's not the type of inspiration where it's you, know, you hear something and then you get your own idea inspired and then you teach something. It's not like that. These men who are speaking God's word are actually being used by God like an instrument to speak God's word. Jeremiah 1.9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Numbers 23.12, And he answered and said, Must I not take heed to speak that which the Lord hath put in my mouth? So that's even Balaam. Balaam was not a good prophet. He's used as a bad example. But even so, in Numbers 23, he spoke that which the Lord put in his mouth. Uh, even though he had the wrong reasons for wanting to do it to begin with. Psalm 45, look at this. My heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of, of a ready writer. And I like this verse because generally when people talk about, they say, oh, you know, the Bible's not perfect. It's uh, written by men or it's spoken by men. Well, sometimes we'd use the analogy. Well, when you use a pen to write something down, is the, the pen writing the words or is it you? No, you'd say it's the author. He's using the pen to write the author's words down. And this is how God is using men. He's using men like a pen. Where David even says here, My heart is indicting good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. So you see how God uses David to speak his word. Luke 1, 67. I just want to show you this. this is all, there's a lot of verses on this, you know. 
And his father, Zacharias, as John the Baptist's father, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and has raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. So this is when he, you know, if you remember, he was told that he was going to have a son, he didn't believe it, in the temple, so he lost his voice. This is when he gets his voice back, right, after uh, John the Baptist is born. <coughs> and he says his name will be John on the, on the writing board. And he spake... He's talking about David. And he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. So who spake? God spake by the mouth of his holy prophets. It wasn't the holy prophets speaking their own words. The holy prophets were speaking the words of God. Hebrews 1, God who had sundry times and in diverse manners, which means various, right? Sundry and diverse are just sort of like synonyms. Sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So this idea that God's word is spoken before it was written down. So why is that important? Like I was saying before, what's important about the originals is not the paper that it was written on, right? It's the words that they were communicating. But even if those originals are lost, does that mean God's word is lost? No, because God's word is spoken. God's word is a living spirit that even though, you know, the paper might be lost. I mean, many people have tried to destroy God's word by burning Bibles. What's that? That's impacting the effectiveness of us sharing and spreading the word of God, right? That's why when you write, you write it down. And, and this is why God had them write it down because it increases. If his word is published and written down, then it's easier to spread. It's easier to preach from. But if we don't have it written down, does that mean it doesn't exist? No, because... It is first spoken before it is written. Of course, the Bible is written down, right? And God's will is that it is written down, that it is published, so that, it, like I said, it can be shared more easily and that we have scriptures to refer to. And we see here in 2 Peter 1, um, I believe, is, is showing God's will that, you know, he wants, after he... You know, he's delivered the word, and even though Jesus came and physically, you know, the word is delivered physically to us, and he's gone away, that he wants us to be able to have his words in remembrance with us after he's gone. Second Peter 1, verse 15. So the word of God is written. Verse 15. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. So this is Peter now. You know, I believe expressing the will of God here, that there are words that he's going to say to them, um, that is the word of God, that he wants them to have after he's gone. Right? For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So he's saying, that he's saying here, you know, we haven't made up fairy tales like a lot of people do. We actually saw these things that we are preaching to you. And that's, that's one of the big differences with, um, you know, the, the apostles as opposed to just other religions. You know, other religions are just telling you about things that they believe or that they were taught, they were told, they didn't witness themselves. Whereas the apostles died and preached, you know, what they actually experienced. So it's, it's, a, it's a very different level of conviction, right? Verse 17. For he received from God the Father honour and glory... When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. What is Peter referring to here? He's referring to when him and other of the disciples went up to the mount, right, and Jesus was transfigured before them. And he's saying to them, look, we, we haven't followed cunningly devised fables, meaning they were witnesses of the death, the resurrection, the transfiguration. They heard the voice from heaven when the voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Look at verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So what is this more sure word of prophecy? You say, Victor, you know, what could be more sure than, my own, than what I see and what I experience with my own eyes? 
And don't you see that amongst Christians today? It's like, oh, you know, even though their experience goes against the word of God, even though their experience led them down a false religion, their experience leads them down false doctrine, but they say, but, you, but I felt it. You know, I experienced it. You can't, you know, you can't take away like what I experienced, what I saw with my own eyes, what I felt. Hey, Peter was in the holy mouth, saw with his own eyes, Jesus transfigured, heard with his own ears, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And yet even though he had that experience, you know, he said, well, you know, I have a more sure word of prophecy. He was more sure about what the scripture, the word of God that he had. We have also a more, a more sure word of prophecy. And that's what I want you to realize today. That, you know, when you read the word of God, that's what you can be most sure of. The word of God, that you put your faith in that and that you interpret experiences, feelings, you know, situations in light of that word rather than the other way around. Knowing this first, first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Right? So it wasn't man's will that delivered these scriptures to us, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So you see there, it's not just delivered by these men, it's not just men's words. God used these men to deliver us these words that we are seeing today. Right? Acts 1. Acts 1. Let's um, look at some verses about you know, the word being written, this spoken word being written down. Acts 1.15. In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said the number of the names together were about 120. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs be fulfilled, which is the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David. So you see there, the Holy Ghost speaking through men spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus, for he was numbered with us and obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as the, that field is called in their proper tongue a seldoma, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of the Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric, that's, uh, that means office, let another take. Okay, so you can see there that he's referring to David, speaking by the mouth of the Holy Ghost, that word was written down in the Psalms. Job 19, 23, look what Job says here. He says, oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book, that they were graven with an iron pen and led in the rock forever. So we see here that the word of God and even you know, the will of Job here when he was saying it here and his will was fulfilled, his, Job, his, his words, so we're reading them today. You know, God's will is the same. Like he wants his words written down, printed in a book, right, so that we have them to teach and to read today. It's how the word can be passed on and delivered to people to, to learn. Deuteronomy 30, 31, 24. And it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book until they were finished. So we see here the law delivered to Moses. Moses wrote those words down in a book and thankfully that, that did happen because we have them today. Jeremiah 30, verse 2. Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is given by inspiration of God. So all scripture, scripture is what is written down. That's why we refer to them as the scriptures. That's the word of God written down that we have with us today. It is given by inspiration of God. So this is the word that you don't want to misunderstand. Because in the King James Bible, in the Bible, it doesn't just mean inspiration in the sense that we use it today. Like, oh, that was a very inspiring sermon. You know, it was a very inspiring speech. It was a very inspiring action that you did. It's made me want to do this. Inspiration, if you think about like, you know, you know when you expire, you know, you breathe in, you breathe out. That's where this word comes from, to, to breathe, to respire, right? Inspiration is a word that means it's just spoken by God. That's, that's what it's referring to here. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It means that it's spoken by God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. This is the verse that we looked at in Kids Club this morning. And I think a good way to remember this verse 
Um, I think it's good. You can say, the word of God is profitable for doctrine. That's what is right. For reproof, that's what's wrong. For correction, that's how you make it right. And for instruction in righteousness, that's how you keep it right. It's something that's always stuck with me that I learned um, when I was younger. And I just think it's a great way to remember this verse. You know, the Bible teaches us what's right, what's wrong, how to make it right, how to keep it right. And that is, that's the truth. The Bible does have a lot of instruction in it. So it's not only the original writings that, in, that are inspired, right? It's the original word that was inspired, spoken through men and penned down, and these written words that are inspired in a sense that they are the Hebrew <laughs> translation of the eternal word. They're the Greek translation of the eternal word. That's how I believe that it works. All right, let's look at Acts 13. Acts 13. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. So we're talking about God's word here. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, look at this, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. So what am I pointing out here? So again, we're on the topic of it was spoken before it was written, what is written is the words that were spoken, right? So, and, the, and why, why am I saying this? You say, Victor, isn't he saying the same thing? Are you just repeating yourself? The point I'm making is, you know, we don't want to have too, em too much emphasis on the actual physical written itself. That's not what's so important. It's what's, what's good about having it physically written down is that we're able to know what was spoken, right? But they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. Now, it's not even important who penned down the scriptures. You say, does it matter who penned down the scriptures? Does that change how inspired they are? No, because even though Paul was used to preach a lot of God's word, Paul was not the one that wrote down everything that he preached. Look at Romans 16. Was, we, we think Romans was Paul's epistle, right? But did you know that Paul did not write the epistle of Romans? Look at Romans 16, verse 22. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. Now, this is not saying that it's Tertius' words. It's just saying that Paul used Tertius to write down the words that Paul was dictating. Right? So it's like you dictate something to your phone and it writes it out. That's what Paul was doing. Paul was preaching word, dictating a letter. Tertius wrote it down. So you can see here what's important is the spoken word. God used men to speak his word, but the people that spoke the word weren't always the ones that wrote it down. Right? So here we have Tertius writing the, book of Rome, uh, the, the letter to the Romans. Now Paul did write some of them. In the Galatian letter, verse 6, 11, uh, chapter 6, 11, verse 11, says here, you see how large a letter I've written unto you with mine own Hand. So that is an example of a letter that he actually wrote himself. And the reason why is because it was a, 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 a letter about work salvation, right? And making, uh, you know, telling people off for um, believing in work salvation. All right, so we know it's spoken first. It's eternal, spoken first. That spoken word was written down and now it's copied, right? It's published and copied and copied and copied and copied. And the objection people really have is, well, we only have copies, therefore they can't be perfect. Uh, and what I want to show you in the Bible is, no, we have examples in the Bible where copies are made and they are what ended up in the Bible. I don't know if you know that. But let's just first see a couple of passages where we see God's word being copied, right? There's nothing wrong. Like, so if you understand the point that I was making previously, that the emphasis is not on the actual written and you have left emphasis on you know, whether the originals are there and whether what you're using is a copy or not because it doesn't matter if it's a copy as long as it's an accurate copy of what the originals actually said. Joshua 8.30 Then Joshua built an altar unto the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal as Moses the servant of the Lord commanded the children of Israel <coughs> as it is written in the book of the law of Moses an altar of whole stones over which no man hath lift up any iron and they offered thereon burnt offerings unto the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. And he wrote there upon the stones a copy 
of the law of Moses, which he wrote in the presence of the children of Israel. So here is Joshua writing a copy of the books of Moses, right? So we have this idea that God's word is copied. There's not just one, co one delivery and then that's what matters and that's all that is used. No, God's word, he wanted it copied. He wanted it to be published, right? Published is not just preached, you know, and made known. It's, you know, to, to get it out there, right? So people have it. Deuteronomy 17, 18. And it shall be, this is our instruction to the king of Israel, right? And it was not ideal that Israel had a king, but they wanted to be like all the other nations. They made themselves a king and it's not a good idea. It's not the, not the ideal form of government, but that's what they wanted. And here was some instruction to the king. And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him and he shall read therein all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. So we see here that God's word is being copied, right? And that's the, we have copies today. We don't have the original state. The originals are long gone. Destroy, you know, either destroyed or lost or used up. But it doesn't matter if they are gone because if you have copies, you have 20 copies of that original or that copy that you copied from, then it doesn't matter. It's been preserved. And then, um, you know, it's like when you get a new Bible, your old Bible, you may dispose of if it's all falling apart. Uh, but it doesn't matter because you've got another copy of it. But this is interesting, right? In the Bible, there are actually copies of things that come into God's Word. So when people say, well, a copy of God's Word can't be 100% accurate, can't be God's Word, well then why, and this is why I like pointing out these examples, because why in the Bible are there copies and they are what we consider God's perfect Word? In Ezra, there are three examples. Look in verse 11. This is a copy of the letter that they sent unto him, even unto Artaxerxes the king, thy servants, the men on this side of the river, and at such time, and the letter goes on. Now, was this the original? No, this was a copy of that letter, and yet it's in God's word. Ezra 5, the copy of the letter that Tatnai, the governor on this side of the river, and Shethar Shetha Bosnai, and his companions, the Afasarchites, which were on the side the river, sent unto Darius the king. So these different letters that happened in the days of Ezra, but yet what we have in God's word is copies of these. Ezra 7.11, now this is a copy of the letter that the king Artaxerxes gave unto Ezra the priest, the scribe, even a scribe of the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. So you say, what was God's inspired word? Was it what was spoken by the king in the letter? Was it what the scribe that wrote down the king's letter, you know, was? Was it the copy that Ezra copied? You know, which one's the one that we're going to, you know, emphasize? Well, like I said, I think it's the one that is spoken. Right? The spoken word is what is inspired, but the writing of it is just a representation of what was, uh, what was spoken. Look at this one in Proverbs 25.1. These are also Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. Right? So Proverbs 25.1, those were all Proverbs that were from Solomon, but what we actually have in Proverbs 25 and how it got into Proverbs 25 were copies of Solomon's Proverbs. Okay? So, before we get on to point five, you know how people always use the um, analogy when they talk about copies of copies of copies of copies? They'll use the analogy to kind of like make you doubt God's word. We don't really have God's perfect word anymore. They'll say it's like Chinese whispers. Right, have you ever heard that analogy? They'll say, oh, it's like Chinese whispers. Chinese, whis Chinese whispers. I don't know that, you know, is it still politically correct to call it Chinese whispers? Probably today it's like, I don't know, is that appropriating Chinese? You know, hey, you racist? The only Chinese people? It's Red Rivers? Anyways, so they, they call it Chinese whispers. You know the game Chinese whispers? You say one thing and that person says it's the next thing. You're not allowed to repeat it. And once you get to the end of Chinese whispers, it's like totally opposite. Well, it's totally different to what it was that initial phrase. And they'll say, oh, you know, copying the Bible's like that. You know, you got errors and errors, c c errors, and then till, oh, you don't even know what you have today. You know, it's what you have today, the original. But that's a completely false analogy. Why? Because in Chinese whispers, you can only say it once, and you can't go back to the first person to check, is, is what I'm saying correct? And then it keeps going, it keeps changing, until, you know, what you have at the end is not even recognizable to what the original phrase was. 
But is that, is that how scriptures get copied? Is that how books get copied? No, because when you copy the original, the original still exists, right? You, 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 can, you can refer back to the original. You can check whether it's right. If there are mistakes, people might use the copy, realize there's a mistake, and then correct it until you have a bunch of copies that are accurate, and now the original no longer matters. And now you have several copies of that original, and when you copy it again, so you, you need to understand that with written text, it, you, you don't get less sure the more copies that get created. You get more sure. Why? Because it's just reinforcing what is already there. And, and we would use the analogy, it's like today. It's like, does anyone question what is in you know, Shakespeare's, you know, Romeo and Juliet, you know, these writings that have been copied and copied and copied and copied? No. There's no question about what's in them. Why? Because there's so many copies that if somebody tried to change it, you'd know where it was changed. And the Bible's the same. That's why as it's copied, it's not getting less accurate. It's actually, you know, um, reinforcing uh, what is there and what is being passed down. So don't buy into this analogy of Chinese whispers because it, it doesn't actually fit the way... Um, uh, translation or what, the way copies are actually done. If you were to use an analogy of Chinese whispers, it would be like the first person that knew the phrase can keep telling each person that goes down the line and then verify at the end of the line do they have the right phrase before that person speaks. It. In that case, you'd, you'd get a, a, a very, very, uh, actually no errors at all, you know, if it's, if it's like that. Okay, so we have it copied. Number five is then it's translated. So people will say, well, translations cannot be perfect. And they'll say, you know, meaning is always lost in translation, therefore a translation can never be perfect. But let me ask you, what if it's, what if it's the Holy Ghost that is doing the translating? If the Holy Ghost is doing the translating, can that translation be perfect? I mean, you know, if God delivers his word, I mean, he's delivering it in a language, first of all, if he decides to deliver it in a different language or change it from one language to another, why can't that be perfect? Why is there this idea that it is impossible to translate something from one language to another? Acts 2, this is the day of Pentecost, when they were given the gift of tongues. They're now preaching the word of God in different languages. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the place, filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So when they went out to preach God's word, and they were preaching it in all sorts of different languages, they weren't just preaching it in Greek, were they getting the real word of God? Of course they were, right? But this just goes to prove that it is possible to preach God's word in another language other than the original language that it was delivered and it still be a perfect word of God. So there's no reason why God's word can't be translated and still be perfect. Look at this in Acts 21 verse 39. It says, Paul said, I am a man which a Jew of Tarsus. So this is when he gets arrested, right? He's being taken away. And he gets an opportunity to address a crowd. A city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. And I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. And when he had given him license, permission, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people. Right? It's kind of like when I cry and get you guys to show. Sit down, please. <laughs> and when there was made a great silence, look at this, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying. So Paul now is going to say all these things in Hebrew which is what Acts 22 is. So you can go and read Acts 22 in your own time. You want to see what, he's, what he said. But what language was the New Testament written in? Greek. So if the inspired word was Hebrew, and it's written down in Greek, can you really tell me that a translation can't be perfect? I mean, we have translations in the Bible. Genesis 42, this is when the brothers of Joseph go to Egypt and Joseph is pretending that he doesn't understand them, right? He's speaking Egyptian, whatever language that they spoke at the time. Joseph said unto them, The third day this do and live, for I fear God. If ye be true men, let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison. Go ye, carry corn for the famine of your houses. Bring your youngest brother unto me, 
so shall your words be verified and ye shall not die. And they did so. And they said one to another, we are verily guilty concerning our brother and that we saw the anguish of his soul and he besought us and we would not hear, therefore is this distress come upon us. And Reuben answered them saying, spake I not unto you saying, do not sin against the child and ye would not hear, therefore behold, also his blood is required. And they knew not, look at this, and they knew not that Joseph understood them for he spake unto them by an interpreter. So you see there, think about this scenario, right? Like Joseph is speaking Egyptian by an interpreter and then you have his brethren speaking Hebrew. Who knows what language it was recorded in? And then Moses is now writing it in, in Hebrew. Which one's inspired? Right, well that's why, as you can see that the language, you know, God's word can be in any language, right? It's not, it's not bound to one language or hidden in one language and, and these are some good examples to think about where you say well you know if i'm saying it's just in hebrew well how do we account for the fact that it's spoken in other languages recorded in other languages and now delivered in hebrew daniel 4 this is a letter by nebuchadnezzar the king unto all people nations and languages that dwell in all the earth peace be multiplied unto you I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. <coughs> and his dominion is from generation to generation. So we can see here that a letter written to all nations, all languages, which one was inspired? Well, the word of God is inspired. It can be in different languages and still be perfect. That's the point I'm making there under translation. And uh, the last section we'll go to um, is preserved before we just take a quick look at Jeremiah 36. God's word is preserved, right? Now these are things that we take by faith. Now we know God wants us to have his word. He's delivered his word, his word is written down, his word is copied and it's translated so it has it. So we have it for us today, and I believe it's God's word that is preserved till today. I don't believe we don't have a perfect copy of God's word on the earth. Some people believe that. Some people believe that there is no perfect copy anymore, and the things that we find, that's just the best we have, and we just have to try and figure out what God's perfect word was from those fragments, from those manuscripts. And I don't believe it. I believe there is a perfect word of God with us today. And I believe in English it's the King James Bible. Matthew 24, verse 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Look at what he says here in Isaiah 59, 21. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee and my words, which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seeds. Seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth, and forever so i believe we have these promises in god's word that we will always have his word with us we looked at second timothy three sixteen. all scripture is given by inspiration of god and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness we look at verse 17 that the man of god may be perfect thoroughly furnished unto all good works now how can the man of god be perfect and truly furnished unto all good works if you don't know what all the good works are. See, so we know what all the good works are because they're in God's word, they're delivered to us, they're complete now that the man of God may be perfect. Luke 4, this is when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness um, to make the stones bread. And look what Jesus answered him saying, it is written. See, it's not that it was written, and right, he's referring to Old Testament scriptures here. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So can you live by every word of God if you don't have every word of God? Right? So I understand that God's word is delivered over time. Right? But now that we have God's word, we have every word of God that God intended for us. Right? Now, Jeremiah 36, I just want to point out a few verses here quickly, because you can see here 
and uh, like what we read through at the beginning, you can see here these elements of how God's word is delivered. And that's why I think it's an interesting passage in Jeremiah 36. It says here in verse 2, Take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel, and against Judah, and against all the nations, from the day I spake unto thee, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. So we see there the delivery of God's word, that it came from God. These are not Jeremiah's words, these are God's words, and God is commanded to, uh, God is commanding Jeremiah to write it down. But look at what Jeremiah does in verse 3. Then Jeremiah called Barak, the son of Neriah, and Barak wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord which he had spoken unto him upon a roll of a book. So you see here, God is commanding Jeremiah, hey, write it. Jeremiah speaks them to Barak, and Barak is actually the one that writes them down. So we can see here, that's very similar to Paul's epistle to the Romans, isn't it? That Paul is the one speaking it from God, but yet Tertius is the one that wrote it down. Verse 8, And Barak the son of Neriah did according to all that Jeremiah the prophet commanded him, reading in the book uh, the words of the Lord in the Lord's house. So this is now, Barak is the one delivering it to the people. But now is it Barak? You know, is it, does it doesn't matter whether it's Barak or Jeremiah, I mean, it's God's word. It's just that these men were used of God to deliver it. Verse 9, And it came to pass in the fifth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, in the ninth month, that they proclaimed a fast before the Lord to all the people in Jerusalem and to all the people that came from the cities of Judah unto Jerusalem. So I'm pointing this verse out because, you know, this is how the word of God should impact your life. When you hear the word of God preach, it, there should be some changes. Like here, when you hear the word of God preach, you ought to change and not be like the king that resisted the word of God from Jeremiah. Verse 17, And they asked Barak, saying, Tell us now, how didst thou write all these words at his mouth? Then Barak answered them, He pronounced all these words unto me with his mouth, and I wrote them with ink in a book. Right, and that's how God's word is delivered unto us. Verse 23, And it came to pass that when Jehudi had read three or four leaves, he, he cut it, this is the king, he cut it with the pen knife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. You say, ah, oh, no, the originals, they're gone. Right, here's the originals. So I guess you can ask the question, is, Jer is the book of Jeremiah that was delivered? People are talking about, oh, the book of Jeremiah, you know, the originals, and they put all this emphasis on the originals. Look, the book of Jeremiah may not have even been the original, because what happened to the original? It got cast into the fire. It was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Verse 27, Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, after that the king had burned the roll, and the words which Barak wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah, saying, Verse 28, Take thee again another roll, and write, it in, write in it all the former words that were in the first roll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, hath burned. Then took Jeremiah another roll, verse 32, and gave it to Barak the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein, the, from the mouth of Jeremiah, all the words of the book which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire, and there were added besides unto them many like words. So you can see there, it doesn't matter if the originals was lost, because God's word is, does not lost, right? It can always be re-delivered if it needed to, but today we have it copied and copied and translated in all different languages that God's word is here with us today. All right, so recap. God's word is eternal, it's first spoken, and it's secondly written, right? So that's why we, we don't want to put too much emphasis on the written word, but we, we still love the fact that it's written because we can use it and preach it and share it. It's been copied. And remember, copied is not like Chinese whispers. You know, the more you copy something, the more sure you know what there is, right? Then it's translated. Just because the word of God is translated, does that mean it can't be perfect? No, because we have translations of God's word in the Bible, right? And we have the Holy Spirit translating the word of God too. There's no reason why just because something is translated that it can't be perfect. Remember, the word of God existed prior to earthly languages. So even delivering it the first time in one sense is a translation, right? So moving it to another language does not necessarily mean it's not perfect. And that's, I'm not saying every translation is perfect. I'm just saying it's possible for a translation to be perfect. It's not impossible. And lastly, it's preserved for us today. 
So what's the point of this sermon? Hey, when you read your Bible, and hopefully you are reading your Bible, when you read it, you can trust what you're reading. So read it as though God is speaking to you. You know, I think it's very dangerous for this attitude that's permeating in Christian circles where you read it and you think, yea, hath God said? Maybe, even in the originals, it means something else, right? And that's a very dangerous place to be. You want to be able to read the Word of God, trust the Word of God, preach the Word of God, you know, with confidence and boldness. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your Word. Thank you that we have it with us today. Thank you that you did use man to deliver it, to write it down, to copy it for us. And now, Lord, we have it electronically. We can just search it in an instant. And Lord, I just pray that we would, you know, we, we, um, you've given us so much. I pray, Lord, that we will do much with it. So help us, Lord. Give us your grace. Help us not to be um, sluggards in our Christian life. And we just pray that you'll bless the rest of our gathering here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.